Good morning. We want to welcome all of our online visitors uh, to our service today. Those who are watching us by YouTube or maybe by Facebook uh, later on today. We trust that at the end of this message that you will have been impacted and empowered. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to speak the word of God to this your people. Thank you for the mighty Holy Spirit you've sent to indwell us to be our teacher and to be our guide. We trust you, Holy Spirit, to live big in us, to think through our minds, to speak through our lips, to unveil, reveal, unfold the word of God into our spirit being. And we pray for all of us that we will not just be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. And for this, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be coming from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, uh, the first 20 verses. Uh, I'm going to read from the message translation. Of course, the reading will be a little different than you have there if you're reading King James, but uh, I believe you can follow along with us. The first 20 verses of Mark, chapter 5. And they arrived on the other side of the sea in the country of the, the Gerizines, as Jesus got out of the boat, a madman from the cemetery came up to him. He lived there among the tombs and in the graves, and nobody could restrain him. He couldn't be chained, couldn't be tied down. He'd been tied up so many times with chains and ropes, but he just breaks them. He snaps the ropes. Nobody was strong enough to tame him. Night and day, he roamed through the graves and the hills, screaming out and slashing himself with sharp stones. When he saw Jesus a long way off, he ran and bowed to in worship before him, then howled in protest. What business do you have, Jesus, son of the most high God, messing with me? I swear to God, don't give me a hard time. Jesus had just commanded the tormenting evil spirit, come out of the man. And then Jesus asked him a question, says, what is your name? And he says, my name is mob, or in King James it uses the word legion. I'm a rioting mob. Then he desperately begged Jesus not to banish him out from the country. A large herd of pigs was grazing and rooting on a nearby hill, and the demons begged him, said, send us into those pigs so we can live in them. So Jesus gave the order, go ahead. But it was even worse for the pigs than it was for the man. Crazed, they, stamp, they stamp, uh, stampeded excuse me, over a cliff into the sea and they drowned. Those tending the pigs, scared to death, bolted and told their story in town and country. Everyone wanted to see what happened. They came up to Jesus and saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothes and making sense, no longer a walking madhouse of a man. Those who had seen it told the others what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs. At first, they were in awe, and then they were upset. Upset over the drowned pigs, they demanded that Jesus leave and don't come back. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the demon-delivered man begged to go along with him, but he wouldn't let him go. Jesus said, go home to your own people or your friends and tell them your story, what the master did and how he had mercy on you. And the man went back and began to preach the 10 town area about what Jesus had done for him, and he was the talk of the town. This morning, the title of the message is Getting It All Together, Getting It All to Together, the Disciples have just witnessed Jesus rebuking the wind, speaking to the sea and telling it to be, be still. And immediately the wind ceases and there was a great calm. They were astonished, obviously more afraid of the power that stopped the winds and sea than the storm itself. They had now landed in the country of the Gadarenes and Gadara was a city south of the Sea of Galilee, east of Jordan in Decapolis a region east of Galilee and Samaria. The country simply refers to the parts outside the city reaching to the city. Upon reaching the coast, they, they meet this man who's been living in the cemetery. 
Our text depicts a man who's possessed by demons. He can't be restrained by natural means. He's broken shackles of his feet, handcuffs off his hands. Nobody's been able to restrain him. All night and all day, he roams the mountains in the cemetery, shrieking and screaming and beating and bruising and cutting himself with stones. He lives in the cemetery in the mountains, cut out of limestone, some 20 feet square. These tombs are hiding places for criminals and dwelling places for the poor and the insane. If this man was living today, 2021, since most medical authorities uh, do not believe in demons, they would la label him suicidal or bipolar or schizophrenic. Whatever the medical term we would use, he is obviously disoriented, dislocated, deranged, disconnected, disturbed, confused, unrestrained, filthy, out of control, mixed up, rowdy, unruly, and self-destructive. He's out of touch with Jesus, with himself, and with his family and the community. This man is messed up. Now, let me hasten to say that this man was not without some intrinsic worth and value. For chances are, before these demons took him over, he may have been blessed with some outstanding talents. He might have been blessed with some great physical strength or ability. He might have had a gifted mind. He might have had many desirable attributes and honorable qualities. He might have been knowledgeable of many job skills and crafts, but even with all that he possibly had going for him before he was attacked by these de demonic forces, something obviously has happened to him and he's been unable to get his life back together and move towards some clear, singular, and positive direction for good. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know somebody like that. Uh, it could be you. It definitely has been me at one time. It could be a friend. You know anybody who's self-destructive? You know anybody that's killed themselves with medically prescribed drugs or poisoned themselves with alcohol or any other illegal drugs? Maybe they're eating themselves sick. You know anybody whose mind just snaps and they end up maybe sexually abusing children or raping women or killing others and and maybe even themselves. I mean, think about it for a minute. What makes a person go into McDonald's or a post office or a church or a school and just blow people away with automatic weapons? How about somebody who, 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 who looked like they had everything going for them, and yet they wander aimlessly through life, seemingly wasting their lives on nothing? I mean, you might remember that in high school, uh, these people were voted most likely to succeed, and now you look at them, they're either in jail, they're doing nothing, or they're dead. I mean, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out this country uh, is in chaos. You know, ever since March of 2020, somehow this country has been unable to marshal all of their talents and abilities and move towards some clear, singular, and positive direction for good. We've been unable to get it all together. I think the, to the total uh, as of today is some 400,000 people dead of COVID-19. 400,000 people dead of COVID-19, and that's just in the United States. We saw January 6th, homegrown American uh, flag-waving domestic terrorists attack our own capital. We've been unable to get this country together, and hopefully and prayerfully, we'll start to heal now. When I think of this man in our text, I, I think about this world that you and I live in, a world in which at creation, God looked at all that he made and said, it's good. He made a world full of natural resources, Beautiful country surrounded by of all of nature that we can see. And now we have man-made technology, medical, scientific, industrial, pharmaceutical advances, full of people of varied backgrounds with multiplicities of skills 
And yet, with all that God has blessed us with, everything God's blessed us with, with all that we know, with all of our resources, we are still unable to get it together and marshal all of our resources and move towards some clear, singular, and positive direction for good. In Martin Luther King Jr.'s book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, I thought it'd be good to use this quote here uh, since we're in January and we just celebrated the Martin Luther King holiday. He tells the story of a novelist who had died, and among his papers were found a list of suggested plots for future stories. And one of the plots he stated, uh, he, he showed a widely separated family who inherits a house in which they have to live together. And what King said in relationship to this novelist and this uh, plot was, this is the great problem of mankind. We live, we've inherited a large house, if, uh, as it were, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white and Easterner and Westerner and Jew and, and Gentile and Catholic and Protestant and Muslim and Hindu and a family unduly separated in ideas and culture and interests who, because we can never live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. God is expecting us to find that organizing principle around which we can rally and move towards some clear, singular, and positive direction for good. I remember this story uh, about a man who, who bought a new pair of pants and he brought them home and discovered that they were two inches too long. And so he goes to his wife and he politely asks her, say, baby, will you hem these for me? And she says to him rather abruptly, says, listen, I work eight hours just like you do. I'm tired. I don't have time to hem your pants. I'm going to bed. And so he asked his mother-in-law, and politely ask her, says, uh, would you hem them for me? And she barks at him, too. She says, listen, I'm tired. I've been keeping your children all day while you go to work. I'm going to bed. So he decided that the best way to get his pants hemmed was to do it himself. So he goes and he gets the scissors, the needle, and the thread, and he sits down in a chair in the kitchen. He cuts off two inches and he hems his pants. After hemming them, he lays them on the chair, puts up the scissors and the needle and the thread, and he goes to bed. About one o'clock that morning, wife wakes up and says to herself, listen, I didn't treat my wife right, my husband right. I'm going to do what he asked me to do. So she goes into the same room, sits in the same chair, picks up the same scissors, gets the same needle and thread, not aware that her husband has already done the hemming, and cuts off two inches, hems the pants on the chair and goes back, to bed. <laughs> and about an hour later, the mother-in-law wakes up and she says to herself, you know, I should have talked to my son-in-law that way. I'm going to do what he asked me to do. So she goes into the same room, gets the same scissors, the same needle and thread, picks up the pants and cuts off two inches and hems the pants and goes back to bed. Well, to make a long story short, <laughs> You can imagine how he felt the next morning when he put on his Bermuda shorts. <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny story, but you think about it for a minute. That's kind of what we do to each other. We, we golf in our own little corners. We do our own little thing and shortcutting everyone else and unable to work side by side and marshal our resources to use all of our people, not use some and screen out others, to involve all our communities, all our committees and commissions to support one another and together, not separately, together, not separately, move towards some clear, singular, and positive direction for good. The truth is, we need to get it together. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, in our text, in the midst of the confusion, J Jesus shows up. He goes to the man. Jesus shows up where trouble is. One way to get it together is to have Jesus show up on the scene. That's what I like about Jesus. He has a way of showing up when I'm in trouble. In fact, the scripture says he's a very present help in the time 
of trouble. Have you ever noticed that when the spirit shows up, everything moves better? You feel excited, refreshed, renewed. Love is shed abroad in our hearts when the Holy Spirit shows up. Secondly, Jesus asked the man, what's your name? In other words, do you really know who you are? The man says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion is a Latin term that refers to some 6,000. So the man had 6,000 spirits operating in his life. In other words, the man said, there are so many of me, I don't know which of me is the real me. Talking about an identity crisis. Now, I've known some people like that. One day they're easy to get along with, and the next you can't stand to be around them. Come on now. One day they're humble, and the next day they're arrogant. One, one day they want to help everybody, the next day they're only self-serving. One day they're full of compliments, the next day nothing but criticism. One day they're anxious to work, the next day they're apathetic about everything. The only one thing that's certain is they are consistently inconsistent. They are consistently inconsistent. And you get confused because you don't know which one of these persons is the real person. I mean, which one can I trust, if any? It's important, listen, it's important that we get it all together. When working on this, uh, I, I, I thought about a story, I thought about a, a time in my own life when my grandmother and my cousin took me to a symphony in Atlanta, Georgia. I was just a, a young, probably not even a teenager. Uh, I don't know, I want to say six or seven years old. But anyway, she took me to a symphony in Atlanta, and uh, uh, my cousin's father was a professional trombone player, and he was playing in the orchestra. Never been to an orchestra, uh, a symphony before. And so I'm sitting down there, and I'm reading through the program, and uh, I'm, I'm getting confused. Uh, coming from a somewhat musical family myself, uh, I did have a little knowledge of what music sound like and what sounds were pleasing to the ear. And the sounds that I were hearing was, were, were, were anything but pleasing. I mean, the trumpet player was playing one melody and the oboe player was playing another melody and the clarinet was, was playing still another melody and the trombone was playing some major scales and the tubas was playing minor scales and the, the drummer was beating out some broken cadence and the Piano a player was playing arpeggios, and the piccolo was playing octaves, and the violin, the viola, the bassoon, the timpani, the flutes, the harp, all of them playing something different. And I mean, it was giving me a headache. And so I started complaining. And so my grandmama told me, says, be quiet now, it's only warm-ups. Then in the middle of my confusion, the noise in the discord came a little old man with a short white stick who stood up on what I know now was called a podium. And after the applause died down, I was amazed because as soon as this little old man with a short white stick raised his hand and waved it in an upward position, everything immediately became silent. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. And then his hands dropped, and suddenly the noise became praise. The jangling discord became joyous chords. All of the distractions became attractions. The separated solos became shared symphonies. The confusing sounds became complimenting sounds. I mean, what a difference. Just a few minutes made. No matter how varied the sounds, how different the instruments, everybody's eyes. I wanted to know what made the difference between all that noise that I used to hear and what I'm hearing now. Everybody's eyes was fixed on one conductor, focused on one common leader. Everybody played their part and it all came together. Today, my friend, if you will keep your eyes on Jesus, our conductor, everything will be all right. This world that we're living in, this period, you've never seen anything like this before. We might not ever see anything like this again. Everything is 
topsy-turvy, but I'm telling you, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, everything will be all right. In the midst of this pandemic, keep your eyes on Jesus. With this racial, political divide of our country, where everything is, is black or white or, or, or radical or conservative or, or, or you know, it's, it's all just broken up into different pieces. Just keep your eyes on Jesus, y'all. Keep your eyes on Jesus. With sickness trying to invade your midst, keep your eyes on Jesus. The hymn writer said it this way. Keep, turn. That's what he said. He said, now listen, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. If you've never given Jesus Christ lordship of your life and your life is topsy-turvy and, you, and you, 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 you're all mixed up and upset, let me tell you, turn your eyes to Jesus. Say to Jesus, say, Lord, I believe you came to this world to forgive me of my sins. I believe on you as Lord and Savior. Forgive me. I want to serve you. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, simple prayer, simple prayer, by faith, I believe you got born again. Your life just started. Mine started in May of 1974 on a Monday night at 12 o'clock midnight. I turned my eyes to Jesus and I've never turned my eyes away from him since. I ask you to follow him and your life will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, everybody around here knows me as Chuck. I've been here, uh, came to Carrollton in 1973 to go to West Georgia, and uh, got saved at the college campus in uh, May of 1974. Started preaching a year later uh, at West Georgia College. My first church was at West Georgia. We met in Kennedy Chapel. Actually got married to, uh, to my wife Gwen of 42 years. Got married right after we graduated. I graduated and got married that June. And uh, we've got uh, two girls. I think they're 40 and 41 now, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and uh, got seven grandkids. And so uh, we started ministry in, uh, at the college again in 1975 is when I started preaching there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed there for about five years and then we uh, worked with uh, Bishop W.T. W. Smith for a couple of years across the street from McDonald's mm -hmm. at the college campus. And then uh, we went to begin to play for churches around town, uh, minister music for five years at Shiloh Baptist Church and New Hope United Methodist Church in Bowden and Morris Chapel United Methodist Church in Carrollton. So I played all the different Sundays at these different churches mm -hmm. and uh, went to seminary uh, ITC during the week, uh, so we went to school during the week, and then we worked as security down here at Sony on Columbia Drive. Right down the street. Right down the street. Mm -hmm. Worked there on the weekends mm -hmm. and played for churches on the weekends. So that's how we kind of kept the money going on the weekends. Went to school during the week and uh, graduated there uh, with a master's in 1980. Five, I believe it was. I'm from Perry, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, a little town next to Fort Valley, below Macon. Uh, that's where I went to, to, all the way from grammar school all the way up uh, to through high school. Perry, Georgia, where the big fair is every year. Right. Oh. This church, we were in Cedar Town from 86 to 92 pastors there in Cedartown and I got the instructions to come back and start this church in uh, that would have been 91 mm -hmm. the close of 91 we came down here in July of 92 and I started the church in July of 92 and it's 28 years ago now 